This session is What Michiganders Want, Investments in Children, is hosted by the Skillman Foundation. Please welcome President and Chief Executive Officer of the Skillman Foundation, Angelique Power. Hi, everybody. Can everyone hear me? Yeah? Um, well, as the voice just said, I'm Angelique Power. I'm one week on the job as the new CEO and president of Skillman. I have never been to Mackinac, and I've never been to the Mackinac Policy Conference. So I'm so excited to be here with each of you, and especially to be in this session in particular, where we're going to share results that are not public yet. Um, so this will be the first time that we share these results about an important poll that we conducted this summer. This is an incredible time. And a hallmark of it is that we are both globally more connected than ever because of this pandemic we're all facing, and yet we're also more divided politically than we've ever been. And because of that, because we've also spent the last 18 months some of us as parents, some of us as godparents or, or aunts and uncles, um, uh, grandparents, being more involved in our children's lives and really acting as adjunct faculty in their education, we've been able to witness that this has been an 18-month period that has changed each of us and has changed them. Um, what we wanted to do at Skillman, a 60-year-old foundation, many of you are probably familiar with us, but we focus on children and youth. We're constantly trying to answer the question, even pre-pandemic, how are the children? And at this time, we recognize that not only is it important to invest our time and resources into our children, we recognize that those investments actually um, deliver outsized returns in the future. And we also understand that children are the barometer of our well-being. And so if children are thriving, then we collectively as a society are thriving. And if children are suffering today, then our collective tomorrows will be difficult. Knowing this, this summer, Skillman joined arms, linked arms, with our partners, Michigan's Children, which is a statewide organization that advocates on behalf of kids, and also with Lake Research Partners, um, which is a national opinion research firm. And we really wanted to hear from each of you. We wanted to find out what, you, what Michiganders across the state are thinking about in this moment, having come through the last 18 months. What are your priorities? What are our priorities? What should we be focusing on? And so today, what we're going to do is hear the research. Not only the local research, but we're going to then be able to contrast it to national poll results as well. Um, we're going to have time for Q&A. I was told that this is a very talkative engaging crowd. And so I'm going to curate our time so that we hear the information, but then we have a chance to really unpack it together and discuss it and make sense of it and ideally turn it into some action. Um, we have two facilitators from the chamber that will help when we get to the Q&A section. They'll be coming around with the mics, holding them for you to introduce yourselves and to add to the conversation. And while Matt Gillard, who is the president and CEO of Michigan's Children, is going to join us shortly and share data, um, I want to give a headline, which is across this beautiful state of Michigan, across racial and ethnic lines, across geography and socioeconomic stratospheres, there is a universality of a response to this poll that is very unique in this time of difference. There is a call and, and I would argue a mandate that we center children and their needs 
And so at this point, I want to invite Matt to come and share some of that research. Thank you. Please welcome President and Chief Executive Officer of Michigan's Children, Matt Gillard. Thank you. Angelique, can you hear me all right? And thanks for stealing my headline, of course. But uh, I'm Matt Gillard, the President and CEO of Michigan's Children. Michigan's Children is a nonprofit child policy and advocacy organization. We're focused on the pursuit of public policy and the best interest of children from cradle to career. We're multi-issue, multifaceted, uh, as Angelique indicated, and we're proud and excited to be partnering with the Skillman Organization or Skillman Foundation on this project. Uh, Prior to becoming a, a full-time child advocate, I actually served in the state legislature. I, I did my sentence, I like to say, uh, in the state house. Uh, I did my six years back in the in the early 2000s. Uh, represented the 106th district, which is the north at that time was the northeastern corner of of the Lower Peninsula. But so I've sat in this room um, from many different perspectives. Certainly as a policymaker, as a child advocate. Um, and now as a presenter again, uh, presenting some exciting data here today. But, uh, but I know what it means. I know that the power of the folks that are in this room can really uh, effectuate change in our state. And we're hopeful that, that what we're presenting today and the conversation that we're having today really kicks us off on that path and leads to a real conversation here in Michigan about what it's going to take for us to emerge from this pandemic even better than we were before and to really have a positive impact on kids. Uh, so we know the pandemic has had a tremendous impact on all of us, right? Uh, but no more so than on children. Uh, children have had a tremendously negative, have been, have been tremendously negatively and challenged by the pandemic, uh, the likes of which we haven't seen in any of our lifetimes. Uh, and we know this, we know this uh, anecdotally, we know this just by, by common sense. But really what we wanted to do by partnering with, with the Skillman Foundation with this project is to understand what the Michigan general public understood or what they knew about this and how they felt about this moving forward. So I'm gonna share some of the data here, obviously in, a, in the 15 minutes or 20 minutes that Angelique was, was kind enough to give me. I'm a former politician, I could have taken the whole hour and more uh, with the captive audience here, but um, in the 15 or 20 minutes, I'll go through some of the highlights from the data that we've seen. I'll co connect us then with uh, Celinda Lake, the pollster, who will answer some more questions and, and give some, some uh, connection to some of the national data we've seen, and then answer questions, fo hopefully, from folks in the room about what this means and what this can mean moving forward. So I'm going to try the clicker now. Oh, look at that. Um, okay, so as, as Angelique indicated, this was a, a joint project with Michigan's Children and the Skillman Foundation, and the poll was conducted by Lake Research Partners, who's a nationally renowned uh, firm with, with really an excellent reputation in the field for being on target and consistent and reliable with the results. So this, phone, this, this survey was a phone survey done of 800 uh, likely voters uh, done in the end of July, first part of August here, so fairly recently, a little over a month ago. Um, but, you know, a fairly robust survey, 800 folks on the phone uh, with a fairly lengthy questionnaire is, is by today's standards, a pretty, pretty decent poll. Um, all right, and what did we see? What did we see was the highlight in the, in the headline that Angelique already shared. Michiganders want more investment and they expect more investment from their elected officials in children. By and large, the general public understands that this pandemic has had a big impact on kids and kids and families both. And they, they believe and they understand and they want there to be public investments moving forward to help mitigate those damages and those challenges that children and families have faced. Uh, and so that was very encouraging right off the bat for us. I mean, if there's nothing else to be taken away from this, the fact that the general public gets it, the voters get it, they understand that to emerge from this pandemic is gonna take investment uh, and significant investment for us to, to help those kids that were so tremendously impacted and are still being impacted by, by the pandemic as we see it today. And this is, a, this is a very surprising part, and I think will be surprising to folks in this room. We even asked them if it meant raising their own taxes. Uh, and in you know, today's politically charged environment, raising taxes of any kind is, is challenging. But even when you talk about raising your own taxes, that's uh, normally uh, uh, certainly a no-no for any elected official. But we even had a, a plurality of folks in Michigan say that even if it meant raising their own taxes, they would support more public investment in children across the board. That's something you don't see very often. We're seeing that a little bit, and, and Celinda will talk about nationally where you, maybe where you can see some of that emerging as well in, in kind of a new attitude from, from the, the public about the role of government moving forward. But uh, in Michigan in particular, this was a very encouraging sign uh, for us to see that folks understand that this is gonna take a, a consensus commitment from everybody moving forward. 
So, and here's another one that, that really I think is a big takeaway for me, uh, having represented an outstate area in the legislature and knowing and, and been involved in politics in Michigan for a long time. Anybody who's been involved in politics in Michigan knows that we often have a significant geographic divide in our political leanings and our political activities and political opportunities. And certainly, uh, you know, the interests and priorities of folks in the, the more urban areas, Southeast Michigan and others, don't often align with the interests of folks in more rural areas. Uh, West, you know, Northern Michigan, the UP, and others. But what was really, really, I think, encouraging that we saw in this poll as well is that across every geographical area of our state, we saw similar results. We saw people understanding, people getting it, people knowing that this, the, the pandemic had a big impact on kids and families across the state, in their communities certainly, but even across the state, and, and supporting increased public investment to mitigate and offset some of those challenges that kids face. This is, uh, there's not many issues where you'll see uh, across the geographical spectrum of Michigan support for one, one type of investment or one, one particular area of focus. And so this is very encouraging, like I said, as, as this conversation evolves and as we move into to actual uh, you know, legislative activity or, or other efforts to, to secure more funding for kids, uh, publicly, th this is going to be critically important. It's going to be critically important that, that those levels maintain and that we're able to utilize the results of this pool, poll to get people to understand that whether you're you know, a state rep, state senator in the western UP or in southeast Michigan, your constituents by and large feel the same way about public investments in children. So what, what are the big areas of concern? I mean, this is certainly, when we get down to, you know, I've done a bunch of, we're, we're just unveiling this as well today to the media outlets around the state, and the media obviously is very interested in this, and they immediately jump to, all right, what does this mean? What are we, looking, what are we talking about? What kind of investments are we talking about? And, and we won't have time to get into all of those in detail today. We'd love to talk to you at Michigan's Children about any and all of these uh, in particular, if people have more interest. But, but here's some of the top levels that you can see on your screen here. I mean, people understand that, that school and education has been a challenge, right, for families. Uh, in the past year, it continues to this day. I mean, any of you who have, have children in school right now, hopefully they're in school, uh, you know, as mine are, but, but we cross our, you know, cross our fingers every night that we're not getting an email from our, our public school district saying that there's been an outbreak or there's been cases detected and classrooms are shutting down. And, and last year was a challenge, certainly, depending, no matter where you live, lived in the state um, for school children, navigating the online versus the in-person and oftentimes switching back and forth or being entirely online. And so everyone knows that, that education, traditional education, uh, has been a challenge for kids in the past year, year and a half, and continues to be a challenge for a lot of them. And so what do we do from that moving forward is certainly a big area of concern when you talk to people, when we talk to people in this public opinion poll. People understand that and people realize that there's going to be a big public role in, in addressing the impacts uh, on the educational side uh, with the pandemic. But then when you move down this list, you see a lot of other areas that don't often get a lot of attention. You know, there's a lot of recognition now of, of the fact that a lot of children, unfortunately way too many children live in, in Michigan, live in households that struggle to meet their basic family needs. Housing, food insecurity, all of these issues are, are more prevalent now than they were at the beginning of the pandemic. And frankly, they were unacceptable before the pandemic even started in Michigan. And so, you know, I, I think the one maybe positive that we can draw out of the pandemic is that we didn't see poll numbers like this at least, you know, we haven't done anything like this in Michigan in, in recent times, but even nationally or other places, these issues weren't as top of mind uh, on voters or on, on constituents and on residents, citizens' minds before the pandemic. And so, you know, we're, we're recognizing that now, uh, and that's a positive and something, frankly, that we have an obligation now to move forward on. Uh, to create the change that we want to see. Trauma, trauma has been a big issue in child advocacy. We know exposure to trauma, especially when early childhood is a big, uh, has a big negative impact on children uh, for a variety of reasons. You know, the pandemic has exposed a lot more trauma and a lot more kids and families' lives for a lot of different reasons. Uh, and this is continuing to draw attention. Mental health as well. Children's mental health issues have long, largely been ignored, frankly, by our elected officials and by our governmental systems, or at least our elected leaders, uh, for a long time. There's a real recognition out there that children's mental health issues are serious and a serious problem that's going to need public attention and public support uh, for us to provide the kinds of supports and services that kids need and families with children need to move forward. 
And then uh, this last one, you know, I talked a little bit about traditional education, but what we're also seeing is the public understanding that out of school time learning opportunities are going to be critically important uh, for children as we move forward. Certainly we're going to have to figure out on the traditional education side what we can do to help kids catch up, but, but out of school time, after school, summer learning programs, and these things are going to be critically important uh, for us to be able to mitigate the damage that's been done uh, educationally for a whole generation of of children that have uh, lived through this pandemic with us. So where should investments be made? This kind of, you, you'll see on this, this kind of mirrors what we just talked about when you can see what the top concerns of folks are. When we ask them where should the investments be made, um, we're seeing you know, a, a similar theme here. Certainly career exposure, job training, and skill building. This is something that we've consistently seen. We have seen increased attention on this from our, from our elected officials in recent years, and, and that's something that's certainly gonna need to continue. Uh, you know, as our economy was evolving already, before the pandemic, that certainly hit a, hit, a, you know, hit a few turns here along the way through the pandemic. And as we emerge from the pandemic, um, certainly there'll be some challenges along that way as well. But having job training, skill building opportunities that meet today's economy and tomorrow's economy are critically important for young people. And the public gets that. Uh, programs to improve kids' mental health. We just talked about this. This is going to be critically important. We have, uh, you know, we're still learning, frankly, and we will be learning for some time what the true impacts of the pandemic were on a lot of children's mental health. Uh, the social emotional connections and others that were lost for significant periods of time as, as communities uh, in different areas of the country, frankly, not just in Michigan, uh, experienced various levels of the pandemic and connectivity with, with peers was, uh, was stagnant or certainly uh, intermittent at best for long periods of time. Uh, and so we're gonna see, you know, we're gonna have a long time dealing with, I think as a public system, public health system in particular, we're gonna have uh, many years of, of figuring out and, and doing what we can to mitigate the mental health impacts that the pandemic has had on our children. Uh, programs that reduce the number of youth in the criminal justice system. This is something that, frankly, we were making some, some pretty good headway on uh, before the pandemic that, unfortunately, maybe got uh, sidetracked a little bit as uh, our state government and others were, were dealing with other more pre pressing issues within the midst of the pandemic. But uh, this is something that we can do a much better job on as a state. We've got some great advocates that focus on these issues. We partner with them at Michigan's Children. Uh, but, but our criminal youth justice system uh, needs some, some significant reforms. I think we're on the right track with that, but there's more that can be done and, and certainly more opportunities for public investment there as well. Child care, child care is a big issue. We at Michigan's Children focus a lot on child care. Affordable child care has become a hot topic in this state and around the country. We're seeing federal support. The federal government uh, consistently now through the pandemic relief bills and, and the discussions that are happening now, recognizing that uh, child care is a critical component uh, as our economy merge, emerges from this. And we've really seen the business community here in Michigan in particular step up and start to lead on child care and investments in child care. Um, but what's important for folks to understand is that there's a huge public role to be played in that. Um, you know, we have, I think for years, relied on philanthropy and and not thought of this as a big, uh, as a public, maybe a, a you know a, a, a public issue or a public government issue. Uh, but what we're recognizing, and certainly our federal government's recognizing, and our state government, I think, is starting to catch on to, is that there's a real role for the government to play in in supporting childcare and the childcare needs of families throughout the state and really across the economic spectrum. Uh, and like I said, expanded learning time. Uh, this is something, an area in particular, where Michigan really lags a, a lot of our neighboring states and a lot of our competitor states uh, in state investment. In, in we have just not significantly made any sort of meaningful state investments into after school or summer learning programs um, in the past. And this is something that the public is understanding and recognizing needs to be a part of the discussion moving forward. So what does the future look like with more investment in children? Here's what the outcomes that when we talk to voters about, well, all right, this, so this is great, you understand there's been this impact of the pandemic, that we're gonna need more public investment. What does that mean and what does the future look like? Well, we want fewer children to experience abuse and neglect. Uh, you know, child abuse and neglect numbers in Michigan are high in comparison to our national averages. Uh, you know, the, the abuse cases maybe get a lot of the attention and are the ones that you see maybe on the headlines or you hear about, but it's the, neg the neglect cases is really where the challenge is. And it's, and it's neglect not because of, of 
really uh, male intent from parents or, or providers or caregivers. It's a lack of uh, you know, stable, stable housing or food insecurity and other issues that lead to a lot of the neglect issues that we see in our state and is something that we need to come to grips with and, and do a much better job of prioritizing as a, as a public system. The number of youth in the ju juvenile justice system will decrease. This is just what we talked about. And this is a huge cost saver, by the way. A lot of these things, I mean, we've been talking for years as child advocates about how investments at the front end save us significant money at the back end. That can be real. I mean, you could talk about any one of these issues, and that's the truth. Uh, the ju juvenile justice system is, is front and center on that. If we can invest a little bit to, to keep people out of, keep young people out of the juvenile justice, justice system, we will save 10 times that on the back end, and really not that long into the future. Is this this isn't a 40 year out return. This is a five to 10 year out return at longest. Uh, children will be better prepared for the workforce in a successful future. I mean, this, all of this ties into this, right? When we talk about education, we talk about out of school time, we talk about career and job training and, and skill building. All of this is aimed at providing opportunities for young people so as they grow old, as they mature, they're able to enter an economy and a workforce that, you know, in a, in a job that's sustainable for them and their future family. Uh, and that's what this is all aimed at. That's what the general public wants to see. That's what our poll, you know, respondents want to see. Um, and they understand understand that it's going to take some, some investment at the front end for us to get there. Kids' mental health will improve. We talked a little bit about this, but mental health issues are, uh, were a challenge before, and they're only going to uh, be exa only have been exacerbated by the pandemic, and we're going to be learning for years to come uh, what the true impact of that will, is. And, and Michigan's economy will improve. I mean, this is another thing. You know, I, I think a lot of us that work in these sectors or, you know, in these communities or in this, in this area realize that but don't always necessarily think that the general public understands that, that these investments aren't just to support, you know, programs or kids or help families along, that they really are meant to improve our economy in the long run. And the, the public gets that. Our poll respondents, I understand that. They understand that investments in, in child care, investments in after school programming are meant to improve our economy. It's not just meant to help those kids that are, that are going to, you know, have a spot now in an after school or summer learning program. It's all, there's a bigger goal in mind and people get that. And economic and racial inequity will, will be reduced. Uh, you know, this is a challenge that we've had here in Michigan. It's not unique to Michigan, but it's a challenge that we've had in Michigan for a long time. And unfortunately, we have not made great strides towards that reduction. Uh, there is growing understanding, certainly from our poll response, that, that people understand that and that this needs to be a priority. And so these investments will lead to that change that a lot of us have been seeking for a long time. So that is the conclusion of my portion right now. Now I am honored to turn this over to Celinda Lake from Lake Research Partners, who is a nationally renowned uh, polling firm, and I'll let Celinda do the rest. Thank you, Matt. Thank you so much. And Angelique, welcome. It's really a pleasure to look forward to a future working together with you. And Matt, um, I'm glad you didn't decide to go into polling <laughs> because you'd be a very formidable force. And that was a great presentation of the data. I want to just um, lift up for you, uh, uh, I'll give you some comparisons of where Michigan stands vis-a-vis -vis some of the national trends as well, and then where Michigan stands um, and just highlight some of the things that Matt presented to you. And that was a wonderful, wonderful summary. And I speak on behalf of uh, Daniel Godoff another partner in our firm who is the head of this project as well. And we have a long relationship with Michigan and delighted to be here virtually, if not in person. So as we compare these Michigan results to national results, we see a lot of similarities in the trends. And we have seen uh, increasingly that people really see children as an investment and they see it as an investment in the future they see it as an investment in the economy, which is very, very strong in Michigan. And they see it as an investment um, in uh, recovery from the pandemic. People, as Matt emphasized, nationally and in Michigan are very, very focused on the cost of the pandemic <laughs> to children's learning and also to mental health, as um, Matt was lifting up. One of the things that uh, is also stronger in Michigan than nationally is the uh, equality and equity frame. That's very, very strong in Michigan. Michigan really wants to provide opportunity 
to every child. And that really unites rural Michigan and Detroit, suburban Michigan and Grand Rapids, uh, suburban Detroit and Grand Rapids. Uh, it's really a unifying theme across the state. And that is stronger in Michigan than it is uh, nationwide. As Matt said to you, Michigan has very, very robust data around supporting these investments, even if it would raise your taxes. And Michigan is very tax sensitive. Michigan is more tax sensitive than the nation, frankly. Um, and yet we see this support for these investments and going from 62% support to 58% support. So really still holding very, very strong and two to one support for the investments, even when we say this is going to increase your taxes. I had the privilege of living in Michigan for nine years. I spent nine years in Ann Arbor and loved it. And uh, I've also worked in Michigan steadily since I left Ann Arbor. And I want to lift up what Matt lifted up as well, which is that every demographic group supports this investment and every region. Some of the most startling data in this survey is the lack of regional differences within the state. And frankly, some of the most startling data in the nation is the lack of regional differences nationally. So this is a very, very strong and robust finding. When we um, talk about um, children and investing in children, people respond two ways, nationally, and they do in Michigan as well. They have a, a, a ton of problems that they think uh, this kind of investment can help alleviate, but they also don't wanna hear just about the problems. They wanna hear about the solutions and they want to hear about the positive vision. And Michiganders who are feeling uh, somewhat negative about things, honestly, right now, and nationally we see voters feeling pretty negative about the direction of the country, feeling very, very strongly about a positive vision that includes doing a better job for our children and really believe that that is possible in a very robust way in education, in help for mental health, in skill training, in criminal justice reform, in providing the basics. And people really respond to the language of a thriving future for Michigan's children. That's very, very strong language nationally and it's very strong language in Michigan. People also have a consensus in Michigan that we aren't doing enough. And uh, not only do we have the new problems that have emerged uh, post pandemic, but Michiganders more than people in a lot of other states tend to think that we're not doing enough for our children. And you have a majority of people uh, focused on that premise. As Matt said, nationwide and in Michigan, there's real intensity be to, uh, behind three forces. Two of them are the same nationally. One force is that our children and our youth are falling behind because of learning losses experienced during COVID. That is a really intense value and feeling in Michigan. It is very intense nationwide. And often it's only parents that are concerned about children's learning losses, but we have now a society where across demographics, across age, people are concerned about this learning loss. Then inadequate help for kids uh, uh, suffering from mental health. This is very strong in Michigan, as Matt said, very strong nationwide as well. And one of the things that's fueling this sentiment right now is voters under 50 and women voters. Both of them very, very concerned about the mental health consequences of COVID and of the period that we've gone through. Michigan is a little different in the nation in that Michigan is very, very concerned about helping children and youth who live in households that are struggling to afford basic needs like food, shelter, and health care. That's a little bit less of a concern nationwide, frankly, but it is a very intense concern and in the top tier in Michigan, and again, across every demographic group. What's really interesting is the problems, the solutions, and the core values all line up in Michigan. There is tremendous alliance. In some areas, uh, people are starting to, are trying to sort this all out. 
in Michigan, there's more of a consensus nationwide and more of an alignment. And people also uh, respond very, very strongly to the voice of business uh, being invested in our children doing well uh, to produce a strong economy, a good workforce, a thriving, uh, thriving communities and thriving state. And as Matt suggested, um, outcomes where fewer kids uh, experience abuse and neglect, a prepared workforce, an improved economy, improved mental health, improved juvenile justice, and a successful future for all of our children. Very, very, very strong norms in Michigan. Again, the programs that Matt suggested uh, relate to core values and relate to these goals. So there's real alignment in Michigan. While people are still kind of sorting this out nationwide, there's tremendous consensus and alliance. And given how divided Michigan can sometimes be, it's really interesting to see that alliance. The messages that are the top for Michigan voters, and Matt relayed some of these to you, have to deal with getting to children early, mental health, the digital divide, and an investment that starts at the local level but goes statewide to help improve the economy. And Michiganders really, really see a link with the economy as well as a commitment to equality. Nationwide, which we thought was of particular interest to you, there's also a very, very recent study that just came out from the small business majority that surveyed a nationwide network of small businesses. And one of the things that they found is that two thirds of small businesses support these kinds of investments and two thirds of small businesses support uh, the child and dependent care tax credit uh, and think that that will help the economy of small businesses as well as large businesses. So what we see is Michigan, if anything, leading the nation, not following, that Michigan has a strong commitment to a triangle, uh, healthier children and children recovering from the pandemic, a stronger economy and equity. And that um, uh, those first two are very strong nationwide, Michigan even more committed to equity uh, than frankly voters are nationwide. And then Michiganders, uh, really, really interested in the positive vision. They don't want to just talk about the problem. They want to talk about solutions. And there's tremendous alliance between core values, our goals, our problems, and our solutions in terms of this investment. And that alignment is stronger and more linear in Michigan than elsewhere. And then business being perceived as very supportive and a very strong uh, voice here. So Matt, um, thank you for your great presentation. And hopefully this shares a little bit about how it's reinforced nationwide. I thank you all and I turn it over to the next folks for the next stage of Q&A. Well, you guys are the next folks. So Matt, come back, join me on the stage. Thank you, Celinda. We wanna open the floor and see if there are any questions just to get us going. Yes, Dave. Hi, Angelique. Welcome home. Thank you. So curious about delivery systems. All of the issues up there can't be delivered through a single system. Probably the one that's most wanting in the state is after school. So what are the delivery mm -hmm. mechanisms and specifically how do we up the ante on, ante on after school programs? Sure. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. And so this has been part of the challenge even more recently around after school. So, you know, we have a I would say a, or a, a very committed network of organizations and folks that are, that are delivering after school services um, in different communities around the state. Like I said, uh, you know, the public support for that has been largely federal dollars through the 21st Century Learning Community Center grants. Um, and we as a state have kicked in very little uh, to support those. Um, now, you know, along comes the pandemic and we get all this education focus and all of this federal money flowing into education um, in, in getting that to the folks that have been consistently providing those supports and services or those programs and being, getting them into a position where they can expand those programs to serve more kids has been part of the challenge. 
Um, because, you know, at, at the same time, I think you're seeing, and, and understandably so, a real interest in the traditional ed community in, in what they would call after school or summer learning programming as well um, because of the impact that, that the pandemic has had, obviously, on their students and this influx of money giving them an opportunity to look at things like that. But that doesn't always match up with the traditional providers we've had. And so, you know, I, I think after school, is, it's a unique situation and, and it's, uh, it's an interesting question. I think, though, in some ways, you know, there is probably better suited from a network of provider opportunity to make, you know, if we got some significant state investment to combine with the federal investment so everybody got their money, we could have a system out there where there was enough spots or opportunities for out-of-school time programming. Um, I worry more on uh, maybe the mental health side and some of these others where there really isn't a network of providers out there. There aren't professionals in those fields to provide a lot of those supports and services and a lot of other challenges. So, you know, I think, um, but, but, but you're right, and, and I think the challenge in Michigan is even further exacerbated by the geographic divide and the geographic uh, uh, differences within so many of our communities. I mean, you know, uh, out of school time programming means one thing in Southeast Michigan. It means a whole different thing in the Western UP where, you know, it's 50 miles to, to, to uh, the next, to, to wherever you need to go maybe to get that. And so um, it, it is gonna be a challenge. I think it's gonna be a challenge across all of these systems uh, the the delivery model, the service delivery model, but I mean that's that's something the public sector deals with, right? About anything, uh, and and I think the encouraging thing from the poll is that the the public recognizes that children need to be a priority, and I'm I'm confident we can figure out delivery models and delivery systems if uh, the will is there from our leaders to make these things a priority. You know the other, and if I may add one quick comment having worked for the After School Alliance in Michigan and having worked for it in a number of states, um, after school programming, and you're right about the difficulty of the delivery and it means different things in different parts, but Michigan is actually one of the states more supportive of after school and out of school programming and has been for, for over a decade. Uh, so it's a really great point that the speaker is raising. We have another question. Sure. Um, oh, sorry. Hi, Mike Horgan from the Upjohn Institute for Employment Research. So I noticed in your results you talk about affordable childcare, which is obviously very important. The flip side that we're very concerned about and we've done a lot of writing on is the compensation of childcare workers and being able to retain a high quality and professionally recognized childcare workforce. And I think that's one of the issues in terms of how we treat that profession. Um, but also it is expensive in terms of maintaining a cadre of, of professional childcare workers. And there's been a lot of closures of childcare centers in Michigan during the pandemic. So that seems to also be an area that I think is of real concern. Great. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. You know, we at Michigan's Children work a lot on childcare issues. And we often say, and a lot of our colleagues and partners that we work with say that, unless we solve the workforce issue, and I mean the workforce of early childhood, the workforce of childcare, unless and until we solve that issue, we're not gonna solve the childcare issue. Because we can't, the system's not sustainable. I mean, we're, when you can go make way more money working at Target or working at the sandwich shop or anywhere else than you can at a childcare center, it's not, the business model's not sustainable. It's not gonna be the level of quality that, that people are gonna demand or expect or want. And there's a lot of challenges. So you're absolutely right. I'll do a, a little, uh, stay tuned, I guess. I think we, we may see some positive news on this front as early as tomorrow with our state budget. Uh, that's that's being announced uh, that I think will will move along move Michigan a long ways in advancing some of these efforts that we've been working on a long time around child care with the workforce front and center on that um, but it's going to take a continued commitment and 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 remember you're going to see all this great news coming out of uh, Lansing potentially tomorrow um, around child care but these are increased federal dollars this is not a state commitment this is not state investment and it, as we move forward it's going to take state investment as well to to continue these efforts we have a question from the gentleman in the back if i can add one other thought to that we just uh, finished about a month ago a national survey for center for community change that they released publicly and we can make sure that it's available to you and we saw a huge soar in the public support nationwide for increasing wages and uh, training for childcare workers. This is an agenda that was always 
lagging behind, lagging behind. It has really soared onto the agenda now, and people supported it as much as the child care tax cut and as much as increasing investment in child care. So they understood the linkage, and this issue has really, really emerged nationwide. Good afternoon, and Angelique. Uh Again, I echo Dave's comments about welcome back. Omari Rush with Culture Source. Um, I just wanted to actually probe a little bit on Dave's question about this distribution. And um, I'm wondering the degree to which you were able to assess the um, alignment on the hows. You know, you talk about mental health, and there's certainly lots of pathways to improving um, the mental health of young people through arts, through after school activities, through sports. And, um, and it seems like there's a lot of opportunity for. Um, for kind of diverging interest and for um, infighting that doesn't allow for the actual investments to get made, despite the fact that there is clarity about the investments needing to be made. So could you say a little bit more about um, what you see as the, the road to how and, and the, the different hows and how they come together? Can I tee something sure. up yeah. and then turn yeah, it to absolutely. you? absolutely. So um, many of you are familiar with Launch Michigan, which has actually been a group of different constituencies that have come to the table over the course of several years. I would say two, three weeks ago in Mackinac, um, teachers, administrators, policymakers, civic leaders, philanthropists came knowing that there, this is a moment for Michigan. There is a collective will. There are resources that are coming, more needed, but there are resources that are on their way. So what's missing is, Omari, to your point, a community design plan. And so that is actually something that didn't begin during the pandemic. It's been in the works for a while now. Um, so I don't know, and you've been yeah. very involved. I don't know if you want to talk no, about that. No, absolutely. No, I think launch is a great example. And I think, I mean, you're absolutely right. And, and I think, you know, the, the purpose of the poll and, and the survey was to get to understand where voters are, right, and to figure that out. But that's not the how, right? This is the what, what do people want, right? The how's the hard part, and it's gonna be the hard part, and we all know that. But what I think, and what Celinda, you know, touched on as well, the encouraging thing from my standpoint is the geographic, you know, um, similarity that we see in this response. Because when we've talked about these issues or issues like this, from a political context in Michigan, it so often gets bogged down to, well, that's only going to help Southeast Michigan, or that's only going to help rural Michigan, or whoever's in control, whoever's got the power in the legislature at the time, or in the governor's office, right? But And, and, and we haven't had data or, or maybe even a consensus of opinion statewide around these issues to fight back on that and say, no, we got to figure this out so it works for everybody. And that's where I hope that we can build from this survey and build this conversation and with the work that Launch is doing and others to say, listen, this is important to everybody. The how is going to be different in, in rural Michigan, in, in the UP than it is in, in Southeast Michigan, but it's important to everybody and we got to figure it out. I want to jump in with a question for you and Celinda. Um, so one of the things that stood out to me is that it's one thing to say, like, investing in kids is great. It's another when you say, yes, you can increase my taxes. And so that was shocking to me. Um, is this because children are a bipartisan issue, or is there something about this moment in particular that elicited that response? So Linda, go ahead. Well, I think there are a number of things going on, and uh, you're absolutely right uh, about how momentous that is, and it's really momentous in Michigan because Michigan is a relatively tax-sensitive state, as you know. Uh, there are three things that can account for it, I think. One, um, the impact of, that the pandemic has had on children is relatively bipartisan. The notion of um, mental health and learning loss is bipartisanly felt. The second is that Michigan has, and you all are such an important voice in this, Michigan has a very clear understanding that our children are a key investment for our economy. We can't have a thriving economy if we don't get our kids in better shape. And that is very bipartisan as well. So people think this money will come back, and it costs us a lot of money not to do this kind of investment. And then um, there is also this commitment that um, there is a sense of urgency right now uh, that makes people think, well, maybe we need to invest, even if, you know, people aren't loving the idea it would increase their taxes, but that there's, we're at this critical crossroads, and uh, this isn't, you can't tell kids, 
you know, wait a few years. Can you just stay eight for a couple of years until we get our act together? Uh, kids kind of march on. And so people feel that urgency. They feel that sense of, if not now, when? And that there, it has some urgency to it, even with all the problems that are on their minds. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking at, the lights are real bright, and I can't see with the mask on. I'm looking for any current legislators here in the room I could pick on, but I, I don't notice any right now, so I'll pick on my friend Wayne Schmidt, who I think we're actually in his district, and I know is going to be here if he's not. But I, I don't expect Wayne to come out tomorrow because of the results of this poll and say, I'm going to raise your taxes, but we're going to invest it on <laughs> kids, right? I mean, I don't, you know, <laughs> that's not what we're likely to see. But, but <laughs> and as a former elected official, I understand that that's not what we're likely to see. But the fact that this data is out there, uh, you know, can be a game changer in these conversations. The fact that people understand, meaning the public understands, that it's going to take, a, you know, some self-sacrifice potentially for us to, to solve these issues and for us to uh, move forward as a state, I, I think can be a game changer in a lot of these political discussions. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you. This is, uh, the attendance here is wonderful. I'm Maureen Comartin, and I'm a Canadian, and I come across from Ontario. My husband is the Council General, a Canadian Council General stationed in uh, the mission in Detroit. but. Today is our federal election. Right now is mm -hmm. happening, so people are going to vote and are at the polls. I wanted to also comment on Angelique's uh, pre you know, initial uh, presentation of your presentation with regards to the holistic approach for children. Obviously, the end result of their growth and development will be commenced in the beginning. So the supports that government place and, and the importance to that support uh, with regards to excellent child care, excellent support for the parents is certainly not only going to pay off economically, but you're going to have healthy, happy, as you all know, children developing into ha happy and healthy adults. The, the, one of the um, federal election platforms right now for th basically three of the major parties is on daycare subsidies. And our Quebec government provides daycares uh, fees of $10 a day per child mm. uh, for families. Uh, we are now on the, on the national platform of hoping to be able to do the same. This has been discussed over a number of years, uh, and it, it began uh, slowly and, and, and it has increased. Uh, when you talk about tax dollars, um, that really benefits the higher income family, the higher income couple. If, if you have couples who have an income that, that's not the fantastic, not, not great, tax dollars uh, as benefit um, with regards to uh, giving them tax credits isn't really going to be that helpful for those, for those individuals and couples who are a lower income status. So you really need to basically provide good quality childcare at a cost. And it is going to cost federal and state governments a good deal of money. But then I think that's what we really need to reflect. If, if we really strongly feel that the quality of care, uh, even for after school programs, et cetera, and childcare, then you, you really have to put the dollars there in order to help those families provide those. And, and, and what also it benefits economically is you're going to be getting more people into the workforce, more women into the workforce. If they know that they can bring their child to a, a, a very good daycare that is going to not cost them you know, insurmountable amounts of money that they can't afford to work. So those benefits really, really are not only holistic, but they're very, very, they're going to help everyone. So it is expensive, and I'm, I'm, more, I'm hoping today, at the end of the day, when our polls close, that the right political party is elected <laughs> in order for that, that vision to actually occur. And I wanted, my, my husband's sitting right here. His name is Joe Comartin. And, I just wanted to let you know that this is excellent. I'm, I'm very pleased to be a part of this today. Thank you. Yep. Welcome. And, you, and affordable childcare was one of the big takeaways. 
Absolutely, yeah. And we've seen, and, and really here in Michigan, we've seen the business community step up in a, in a major way, led by the regional chambers. And the Detroit Regional Chamber, the Grand Rapids Chamber, the Northern Michigan Chamber Alliance, and others have really uh, embraced and, and really focused on childcare uh, with their political might and their political pull efforts um, in Lansing, which has got us to a point where we're in a real good position. And like I said, I think we're going to hear some good news tomorrow. Uh, out of Lansing and, and onward and upward. We've got a long ways to go, but I think we're on the right track. And certainly there's an understanding about all the reasons you said on why this is a critically important issue um, across the spectrum. We have five minutes and we have at least three questions to get to. I see two up here and one in the back. We'll start there and we'll move back up here. Okay. Um, hi, I'm, uh, I'm Hank Cooney. Um, uh, I've been a board member of the regional chamber for many years. I've attended these conferences for many years. Uh, I have a question or a comment, and, and maybe you can fill me in a minute. Maybe you, can, you just uh, answer the question at some level. Um, one, I'd like to have, uh, have you comment about the child tax credit uh, and, and whether that could be made permanent. Uh, it, it cuts into a childhood poverty significantly, uh, and so I'd like to hear what you have to say about that topic. But second of all, um, I'm not a cynic by nature, but I've been coming up to these conferences for a dozen years or more. And the issue of childhood education and that related topic has been at this conference almost every year, and we have not made a lot of progress on it. Um, and these, these numbers that you just put up there told us that. So tell us what do we need to do? I mean, I, when I hear that the, you know, the Michigan, Michigan legislature, Michigan generally doesn't want to raise taxes, and I think we have people, we have Deg Egner here from the, from the foundation community and other areas, Foundation community, from my understanding, is doing their fair share. How do we move the needle to get the, the, the it's going to take government investment. How do we move that needle? What should we be doing here in this room to move that needle forward, um, as difficult as that may be? So, and I want to think the child tax credit is one, one step, but what are the other things that we can really do? I mean, if, if uh, uh, Superintendent Beatty was sitting here, he'd be telling you that you know, the Detroit schools are not getting the investment they need, um, uh, you know, those types of issues. So. Fill us in on that a little yeah, bit. Yeah, absolutely. So I'll start with the child tax credit. And, and, and um, to the point the, the young woman made over here about the Canadian, on the Canadian side, um, you know, it's a fundamental shift in tax policy, really, from the federal government. What we see with the, the new child dependent care tax credit is that it's refundable. I mean, there's, there's, this is money going out monthly into the hands of families that desperately need it to pay for things like child care, to pay for things like food, uh, housing, and other things. And so making that permanent, uh, you know, there's a lot of us working hard to, to try to make sure that that happens, um, and working with a lot of our national partners and our federal uh, members of Congress. But it is, a, uh, it is a game changer from a child poverty standpoint and from a, from a low income working family standpoint, this is the most fundamental shift in tax policy that we've ever seen in this country uh, and is something that I think we'll, our economy will benefit from, uh, the fruits will bear out, and, and we're going to be having conversations about what we can do to expand upon it and to make it permanent. Um, on the issue, I, and I couldn't agree with you more, I, I, I mean, I, I was first elected in 2002, I've been coming up here a long time too, uh, and we have a lot of these same conversations. What I would say, and I, I hate to keep going back to this, but a lot of the reason that these conversations have bogged down in the past or have broken down is because of the political divide that's often fueled by the geographic divide in this state where we have competing interests and, and we can't really get to the big conversation about how do we lift the boat for everybody when, one, there's not enough resources maybe to actually lift the boat for everybody, or we get into this infighting, well, that's only going to work for the urban areas or the rural areas. So that's what's most encouraging about the data that we're seeing is that everybody wants and realizes the boat needs to be lifted. Now, you know, the pandemic obviously is a new, new element as well. And so I think there's a lot of hope um, in, in that we can, we can build off of this and, and get to the level of, of understanding and momentum that we need to truly uh, change these systems. Um, but there, I mean, these are big, big problems. I mean, if we just, if all we did was talk about traditional education, right, in our K-12 system, that's a huge, and we're on the verge of that conversation, whether we want it or not. And, and Superintendent Vitti is great and is going to be a great asset um, as long as he's engaged in that conversation. But we're on the verge of that conversation, whether we want it or not, because the current system is not sustainable either. Uh, and the disparities in the current system are not sustainable. But, but uh, when we talk about all of these issues together, it's a big lift. 
but we're starting to see the general public get it. And that's, I mean, that's how we're going to, the one last thing I'll say is we're heading into a big election here in Michigan. Uh, you know, everyone's sick of elections, but 2022, we're going to have new legislative maps drawn by an independent commission. We've got the governor's office up. We've got, I mean, this is a, uh, we're gonna, and, and what's most exciting and most useful, frankly, from an advocacy organization like ours is this data in an election context, right? Where we can get, if we can get candidates across the state recognizing this and talking about this and talking in their platforms and in their, in their candidate speeches and in their candidate materials about investment in children, well then when, when whoever it is gets elected, we've got them, because right, they're making those promises on the campaign trail and they're gonna make them with data like this. I don't know if we're going to get to three Sorry. questions, but we do have Sorry. three more. <laughs> Hi, good afternoon, Vivian Picard. Um, this has been great. But one question I have is that um, whether or not there has been any definitive discussions regarding combining uh, the needs of child care to our nonprofits, mainly the arts institutions, um, I see Sarah Early here and all that she's doing with Bell Out Conservancy. Okay. I'm on the board of Charles Wright, and I know that we have some very significant programs that are typically held during the day, but they're programs that could easily be targeted to after-school programs. And in doing that, you could serve the needs, really support the needs of a couple of different needs that we have, and that is supporting the needs of nonprofits in terms of helping them to find more financial resources, but also the creativity with these nonprofits in terms of finding programs that are not traditionally uh, after school care programs or daycare programs. They're real programs. They're daycare programs, but they can be programs too where individuals are learning. Um, I just left the um, uh, Henry Ford piece that talked about the healing of arts. Mm -hmm. I mean, and we all know there's a mental health need, there's a child care need, but there's so much that can be done from a creativity perspective that can support the needs of our nonprofits in terms of programming for after school that's not just uh, just all about daycare. It's daycare, mental healing, mental support, and also helping kids to be more creative. Absolutely. I mean, that is just a comment that stands on its own. And thank you for serving on the Charles Wright Board. That's an amazing museum. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Jametta Lilly, uh, blessed to serve as the CEO of the Detroit Parent Network. I just wanted to, one, uh, do a ditto on that statement. There are so many organizations that are not traditional to education, that are fundamental to the ongoing growth and development, not only of children, but their parents. So my question is, I think we have an extraordinary opportunity. Uh, Matt, when you talk about constituencies, it's parents. So I'm wondering how in this moment and in this time, how can we begin to galvanize the voices of parents as essential co-designers mm -hmm. in the systems, the multi-sector approaches and solutions that we need to be focused on our children? Uh, because clearly parents, particularly parents from marginalized communities, uh, all of us in this room, our voices as parents are heard. The constituents that we represent and that we're paid to represent, their voices are more often not heard. So how can we begin to make sure that parents are being equipped and trained to be policy advocates and to stand with us in this work of making sure that our resources are helping our children thrive and thus Michigan thrive? And I think that that is a really important point, and I would argue that that actually ties to the gentleman's question and back about what could be different this time. And often there are voices, you know, there are people in certain rooms that are invited to the room where it happens, and they're the ones who make policy decisions on behalf of others. What we have to do differently this time, and that's why this poll is so important, is to speak to all Michiganders, to speak to those so that they can be co-designers in the solution, as opposed to beneficiaries of someone else's choices on their behalf. This is our moment to do that. Will you bring us home with the last question or comment? Uh, yes, uh, Jason Lee, president of Junior Chief of South East Michigan. Uh, my question is around the data. Thank you. Uh, my question is around the data uh, around expanded learning times. Um, is there any, uh, just digging deeper there, are, is the, uh, the sample size, is it saying that we need more school or, or out of school experiences? And when I say out of school experiences, more experiential learning opportunities for young people. 
So yeah, and I don't know that we get that from, from this survey, right? But I think that's the fundamental question around expanded learning opportunities. And we use that term, expanded learning opportunities, right? Because my kids, most of you in here, your kids get opportunities to learn outside of the classroom. We need to provide those opportunities for the kids who otherwise wouldn't get them. Um, what that has historically meant here in Michigan is, is supporting programs like at the YMCA's, the Boys and Girls Clubs, and other community providers, community-based providers that are providing those services. What we're seeing now is an increased interest from the traditional K-12 community in providing those types of services outside of the classroom or in non-traditional school hours. I think that there's a lot that needs to be, still to be worked out there, would be my, sim my short answer. We want to end on time. Thank you so much for joining us. What I'll say in closing is that we know the last 18 months have done a number on each of us and on our children. What we do in the next 18 months will dictate the next century. So we have the will. Are we listening is the question. So thank you for joining us.